Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. It's hard to imagine that camels, lions, and mammoths once roamed the landscape around Las Vegas, Nevada, but such was the case during the latter part of the Pleistocene era, which spanned a period of time between 11,000 and 2.5 million years ago. The area, known as the Upper Las Vegas Wash, is rich with fossils of these and many other creatures, as well as those of ancient plants and pollens. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. This trove of fossils is preserved within Thule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument, which was established not too long ago, back in 2014. In this week's Traveler podcast, Lynn Riddick talks to Park Superintendent Derek Carter to learn about the treasures contained here and the latest management plans for the site. Nova Scotia, 8,000 miles of coastline dotted with colorful fishing villages, quaint coastal towns, and an abundance of scenic natural beauty. Home to two national parks, Cape Breton Highlands and Kajimakujik. Spend your nights under a canopy of twinkling stars. Spend your days exploring trails, beaches, historical waterways, and tons of cultural and recreational experiences. Visit NovaScotia.com today to start planning your natural getaway. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Situated about 25 miles northwest of the city of Las Vegas, the Thule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument offers a glimpse way back in time when abundant rainfall, spring-fed ponds, and lush wetlands supported diverse life. Today, the remnants of that life are preserved here in what is the only unit of the National Park Service dedicated specifically to the conservation, education, and research of late Pleistocene fossils. Here to tell us more about the monument is Superintendent Derek Carter, checking in from his office in Boulder City, Nevada. Hi, Derek. Welcome to The Traveler. Hi, Lynn. Thanks. Happy to be here. Ah, Glad to have you. Well, let's start by having you tell us where the monument is physically located and what does the surrounding landscape look like? Sure. So the, the monument itself is physically located in North Las Vegas. Um, it's basically Mojave Desert. It's, you're going to find features that you're going to find throughout the Southwest um, with erosion washes, um, yucca, and different uh, flora and fauna throughout the monument. So in North Las Vegas, it's to the north, it's bordered by the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. And to the south, it, there's, you're going to find urban abutting the monument, which is kind of unique in a way. You don't find a lot of outdoor monuments that close to an urban setting. And so you kind of have really the best of both worlds when it comes to having access to a city, but also access to the, the outdoors. Um, to the northeast, or I'm sorry, northwest, you have Creech Air Force Base, and then to the direct west, you have Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area. The site is more than 22,000 acres. Um, what's your staffing like there, and are there staff there on a daily basis? Yeah, so we're a fairly new park, founded in December 19th, 2014. And so with that being a fairly new park, with the time frame of what the park service is and the timeline of parks itself, um, we're currently building that staff capacity and building the, the management plan that will manage and direct us how we're going to manage the monument within 20, 
over the next 20 years. And so currently staff, um, we have five full-time employees uh, consisting of myself, an integrated resource program manager, a park guide for interpretation, a admin support assistant who works in our office space, and then a, a law enforcement ranger. So those, those five permanent, and then we have also a lot of interns that come through the Great Basin Institute, and one's currently doing paleo monitoring, uh, and then the other archaeological monitoring. So how did the monument come to be? What can you tell us about um, how it was initiated as a monument? Yeah, so it's a kind of exciting story, and it's kind of what drove me to kind of apply to the monument itself, the position, and then having the opportunity to work with such a fantastic group. And so it was a grassroots movement from the, the group called the Protectors of Tulu Springs. And so uh, Jill DeStefano, the, the president of the foundation, she and a couple of women that live in North Las Vegas found out through a developer that was going to plow through the monument boundary or what it is today. Um, and they're going to continue to develop, expand North Las Vegas further north. And so they came across fossils, actually some mammoth fossils, and the community found out about it. And these five ladies took it upon themselves to basically go and lobby to congressional delegation, to the public, to anybody that will listen. And they got enough backing that they took it and worked through and submitted to the congressional delegation here in Nevada to pass the naming legislation. Very good. And it was previously Bureau of Land Management uh, land. Is that right? Correct. Yes. So talk a little bit, if you know, a, a brief history of the work that's been done there over the years to uncover and collect fossils. Um, I understand that the first radiocarbon dating technique in the U.S. was done on site there in 1962 during something that was called the Big Dig. What do you know about that? Yeah, so starting out um, over the last couple of years here, so 1933, it kind of started this, this interest within the Las Vegas Basin and kind of uncovering these fossils. And so it was a paleontologist, Fenley Hunter. He was an, an expedition funded by the American Museum of Natural History. So during this expedition, uh, Fenley Hunter found the famous obsidian flake, which was near the Ice Age Camel Bones. And so with that, there was excitement. And so it kind of drove hope to potentially finding evidence of early contact between human, early humans and then ice age animals. But because there was kind of a lack of interest, there's no further evidence uncovered, but it still drove that kind of discovery and expeditionary mindset. And so scientists continued to research the area for decades, um, hoping they're gonna find that early contact between the early humans. And so then in 1962 from this Nevada State Museum, they conducted what we now know as the big day and that was led by geologist Dr. Vance Haynes. Um, and so they created trenches up to a mile long. And there was a couple of trenches. And today you can actually see those here in the monument. We're preserving them uh, as historic trenches because it's such a connection to the past of how it became to be. And so during this excavation, scientists discovered an abundance of the large ice age animal fossils such as mammoths, camels, bisons, ground sloths, and actually the giant North American lion. And then you spoke to radiocarbon dating. And so it was actually during the big dig, it was at this site where scientist Will and Libby first applied the technique of radiocarbon dating in the U.S. So kind of a cool story. Do you know um, what kinds of plants and animals that can be traced to that Ice Age era are still found in the monument? Yeah. So um, the habitats, basically the Ice Age and the habitats of today have some overlap. So all the plants that were around during the ice age here in Vegas are either still in the area um, or they moved to higher elevations or latitudes where it's much cooler. Because during that time, obviously, the climate was a lot cooler and there was a lot of water within this basin. So uh, uh, ancient springs and the ancient river flow through this area. So some plants that are still at two springs that were there during the ice age, uh, glow mallow, which is an orange flower, we have evidence of those being found in fossil sloth dung at a nearby cave outside of Tule Springs. You have the salt bush, the pinyon pine, and juniper were also found at much lower elevations at the time. And but now, now you can only see them as you go up in the mountains in the Spring Mountains that are kind of to the west of the monument itself. 
And then we have uh, many mammals and birds are still around from the ice age. And so you have coyotes, rabbits, pocket gophers, grasshopper mice, kangaroo rats, pack rats, badgers, mountain lions, and hawks. And so all those were around, those small animals were around during the ice age. They're still around today. Interesting. So talk a little bit about your research partners and any digging happening right now. So there's no current active digs happening right now. And that's, that's due to there's a lack of protection. So we can't have, because we're not fully staffed up there and there's not a, a, a 24 hour or, you know, consistent National Park Service presence. So there's no active digs currently taking place, but the Desert Research Institute has been partnering with us to do a desert tortoise and plant inventory, which all these inventories and monitor projects are going to lead into the general manager plan, which we currently kicked off. And so Great Basin Institute is doing a paleo, paleo and arc monitoring and inventory program throughout the, the monument itself. And then USGS is, has, they have current and ongoing geological studies being done with the hydrology and the different features found throughout the monument. So I understand that 40% of the monument has not yet been surveyed. So there's a lot of open space left to investigate. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. So every time a researcher or a project team goes out into the monument, they're finding new areas that have um, highly phosphorus areas, or just we recently did an ethnographic scoping trip and we recently found obsidian flakes, which is pretty exciting um, within the monument itself. And so that continued research, that continued study is going to find I think connect a lot going into the future. So what kind of visitation do you have there? Great question. So um, being fairly new, and before I came into the position, there was, there was things to do. Was, the monument itself is open. But when I came aboard, we kind of sat down as a team and, and wanted to learn how the visitors interacted with the monument. So what we've done was install two temporary trails throughout the monument. So it allows one visitors to, to, to direct the visitor to something of interest, to do a self-interpretation. And then it also serves a second purpose of collecting visitor to use data statistics. And so that's gonna allow us going into this management plan to start collecting that data, do a good analysis of how people are using, how visitors are using that, that trail, and then dictate or kind of plan where we can put more trail systems and interconnect into the regional trail system in Vegas and North Las Vegas. And so uh, right now, currently we have those two temporary trail systems, the trails throughout the monument. And we also have um, existing trails that were already created during when it was managed by the BLM. Um, horseback is allowed, horseback riding is allowed in the monument currently along those pre-established trails and then also mountain biking. Is currently allowed until we have an, a further analysis of all you know, like how these impact the, the monument itself until we have that good data set and good analysis we kind of look at potentially changing those in the future or at even adding more so we'll see how it kind of plays out in the future when we go to the management plan. so visitors are pretty much allowed to wander at will and um, i was curious to know if uh, it's common or even possible for a visitor to find a fossil? And can they keep any rocks and fossils they find? What's the policy on that? Yeah, so you, uh, visitors are allowed to wander at will, and so which is kind of a cool thing to do right now, especially with have a discovery adventure mindset. So it's such a vast, when you get out there, it's such a vast um, an area of desert and cool kind of washy terrain. And so, in all national monuments, national parks, there's a no collection, no taking a policy. So any visitor coming across any fossils, even rocks, you're not, they're not supposed to take those. And so um, visitors will come across fossils. And so currently a lot of what happens is, and it takes a trained eye, believe me, when I first came on board it, I was out in the monument pointing to different things and saying, is this a fossil? Is this a fossil? <laughs> Walking with a paleontologist and, of course, I was just pointing to rocks. And so what has happened now, you know, just through the times and through the different flooding and through the wash, the different sedimentary layers also being exposed, you'll, you'll have a lot of fragments of ivory and fragments of fossils for coming to the surface. And so that's what these paleo monitoring projects are, are there to do is find highly phosphorus areas 
the monitoring will make sure they're not being taken, destroyed, and seeing how they're protected until we have the time to do a full collection. We do have some ideas floating around potentially, you know, during this general management plan of how we want to preserve fossils that are large in size in situ. And so to give that visitor experience, but we don't know how that will play out because it's tough to, to allow fossils out in the open like that and then have the visitor interact because in the past we've had I guess a leak so a, a dig was happening someone came in after to the site because they'd heard about it and destroyed the fossil for whatever reason and I think they were trying to steal it uh, and it broke apart so we have we can't it's hard to kind of have those bigger larger fossil specimens in situ and have them out there for the visitor to see yeah, I was curious about that because I know that tens of thousands of fossils have been collected there over the years and they're kept at a number of different facilities, uh, including the Nevada State Museum and San Bernardino County Museum in California. And I was just curious to know if if there is a desire to bring some of those specimens and ones discovered from this point forward to a future museum at the monument. Yeah, good question. So um, we've talked about that and discussed it. So we have, we've worked with the San Bernardino Museum there and we have, we're trying to bring that that collection to at least bring it back to Las Vegas, keep it within the Nevada State Museum. So going forward, and I've t- discussed this with the advisory council and we discussed it during the general management plan, but per the enabling legislation, we're supposed to build a repository on site. And so that repository the idea we're kind of envisioning here would be a research learning center. So we can have scientists, paleontologists have the, the repository of all the specimens together, right? And while they're all together on site and anyone in the future, uh, they're stored there as well. But we'll have the scientists and paleo, paleontologists interacting, potentially with the visitor. I to kind of look at it as an interaction site and then also have research seminars and, and future learning uh, educational opportunities for any visitors that may come through as well. Yeah, there's um, not much there now at the site. No visitor center, no restrooms. And the you know you did mention the two trails that are recently created. So what else is topping the list of things to do? Yeah. Attempts to get power and water there. So currently, so I don't know if you know, so Ice Age Fossil State Park it is a 300-acre state park, State Parks Nevada, and so they are near the historic trenches. And so we've partnered with them and we're entering into a cooperative management agreement so where we can have at least some NPS National Park Service presence on site. And so a National Park Service ranger will be working out of that visitor center and that's set to be open, I believe sometime early 2022. And so it's a brand new visitor center. They'll have trail systems as well. And their interpretation is going to be of the big dig sites. So that hits 1960s big dig era. But we want to interpret the, you know, the, the monument as a whole. So hopefully that will draw a lot of visitors. And then when we go into this general management plan, that will kind of lead us to where we would like to either do another visitor center, which might be too much, or look at the repository research learning center combination and have that as an interaction interpretation center to get a different perspective from what the state parks is interpreting. What kind of key issues and concerns are there in the development of the monument? So we do have currently, because of how it was managed by the Bureau of Land Management, there's a lot of free access, right? So free access to off-road vehicles and, and target shooting. And so since it's been fenced, there has been a great reduction, almost a 75% reduction, if not more, in off-road vehicle travel and also target shooting. So that was through the efforts of the law enforcement rangers going out, educating folks, stopping them from what they're doing, prohibited um, activities, and then also educating them to where they can go do it near Las Vegas, um, just north or south or whatever around the area. So it still gave them the opportunity to go do the activity they wanted to do, but just not on the monument property. And half the battle was educating those folks that did it because they don't know what they're potentially destroying it the fossils, right? So that's kind of where the preservation and protection education takes place. And so also there's concern with just the urban abutment. And so 
So the development is another issue. And so currently the development is still going and we have, we're working with the two different, two actually two different developers now that have parcels that they're currently developing that will be abutting the south unit of the National Monument. So the Villages of Tooth Spring is one and then Olympia Developers is another. So we're, we work closely with them. We meet monthly with them as they're going through these different concepts and schematics of their development. We'll work with them to make sure, you know, the different mitigations are putting in place with runoff, native species plants and restoration along their borders, they're abutting the monument itself. And then also just how we're going to educate the potential buyer in the future and how we're going to integrate and collaborate with the community chairs, the HOAs or whatnot not, within those communities to educate them of what the monument is, how to protect and preserve it. And it's not like it's not a free recreational uh, monument, like a park, because at the get go of some of these developments, they were considering this as a, hey, you're right next to a national monument. There's your recreational opportunity. It's like, well, there's different recreational opportunities <laughs> and within a fossil national monument versus a community park with basketball rings and going out to go down, you know, play catch or whatnot. So there's a different how you interact with that public land is a little different. So, um, yeah, but the cities have been great. Honestly, the developers have been great and working with the monument because they know that we're there to protect and preserve it. And then they want to also do the same. How big are these communities? They're pretty vast. Uh, uh, I would say anywhere from, I mean, the one, the villages of Two Springs, I believe they're trying to get 400 plus houses in there. There's going to be a lot. And it's it's interesting because there was a land exchange agreement that took place during, and then the neighbor legislation was written that allows the villages of Two Springs to cross over the monument via a bridge and then they're going to build within this parcel that is completely surrounded by the monument so that was negotiated well before my time it was back in 2015 2016 and but we're working with those developers to make sure that you know right putting those mitigations in place and then they also are part of the agreement of building the first permanent trail so it's going to be the tufa trail which is going to lead through this ancient tufa beds that came around through deposits through the ancient spring systems that ran through the area. It's a pretty cool trail system. So I want to go back to some of the comments that you made about um, previously when the area was managed by the Bureau of Land Management and activities like firearms, target shooting, off-road vehicles, specimen collecting, and even dumping of junk um, uh, well, I don't think dumping of junk was permitted, but uh, the firearms, the off-road vehicles were. And I I was encouraged to hear that you say that public acceptance and compliance have been good. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it, it took some time. You know, I've heard the horror stories prior to my time coming into the superintendency that, you know, it was just, it was never ending. But I think through the consistent presence of the National Park Service LA Rangers we have on staff, the education, right, showing that these are how they can still interact with public lands, but just not in this particular area because of the preservation of the fossils, right? And so, of course, you're going to have the ones or twos that are against it, but I think over time, they're going to learn that, they hey, they can go do the same thing in different areas. And so, you kind of mentioned the dumping, which it blew me away when I came but that's a thing here. <laughs> and so the South unit used to look like, and then there's two different units within the monument. There's a South and a North. It's divided by a renewable energy corridor, which was per the enabling legislation as well. And so the South unit had just as much trash as the North unit. Propane tanks, abandoned refrigerators, couches, a burnt boat. And so through the efforts of the protectors of Two Springs over time, over the last couple of years, they have removed... 95 to 98% of all the, the bigger legacy trash that was within that South unit. And so now the focus is still on the South unit of getting that, what we call micro trash or just trash that kind of comes over time. But the North unit still has a lot of the legacy trash, the big you know, burnout cars, propane tanks. And so, and that's where a lot of the target shooting also took place. And so there's fragments there, shell casings. 
And so our goal now is to look at how we can preserve that or at least clean it up and then focus on the preservation, restoration. And so we're working with the Clark County to put in a fence. And so for the Southern Nevada land management funding, they are putting in a fence line that's going to, because currently there's no fence that kind of blocks off that access. It's through just constant enforcement of those areas with the law enforcement rangers to see if any off-road travel or target shootings happen. So this, this gate is going to allow us to deny access, not deny access, but limit access at least to vehicles. We'll have administrative gates, pedestrian gates is there as well. But it will allow us to start that restoration process. And then we can focus efforts to pull out the, the legacy trash. We've already had that on the calendar for next year, working with a lot of organizations around the Las Vegas area to make it a big event to pull out some of those bigger items. And then we have the super funds or the circular funds that are kind of come in 2023. And so because the area was a, a, a basically a, a legacy, I would say, shooting range, there's a lot of lead, which is in the topsoil of some of those areas. And so it is a super fun site. And so those will come and, and clean out that area and at least get that restoration process kicked off even further. So we're super excited to get that started because it's going to clean up some of those areas up there. And I personally think that's one of the <laughs> coolest areas of the monument because it it's a little further outside the city, but it allows you to access into these washes, which are 30 some feet deep. And then you just kind of are surrounded by what I think is a wilderness feel, but you're so close to Las Vegas itself that you would not even know it. Yeah. To hear the words super fun site, that's a little alarming. It is, but like it's a, and I work with the public health officers and it is a lot of lead. It's the lead that's high in some of these areas where the range, like a lot of target shooting was happening. And so I asked that too. And I envisioned something going through there before we got cleaned up because, and here's, here was why my vision for it. I don't know how much traction we're going to get with it, but it would be to create a temporary trail through that area because it shows what the monument was and then lead visitors to what the monument is now to the south unit. It's kind of like a trash to like the trash trail that shows what, people have done to the land over time. But and I asked, I was like, can we walk through that? Can we walk through these super fun sites? Is there any health risks? And they, because it's lead, unless you're there digging in the soil and then over long-term exposure, there's really no health effects from it. Because I was kind of concerned with that too. Because people still go in there regardless if we have a trail in there or not. It's just kind of how they're interacting with that site. And so I don't know how much traction we'll get that vision of mine, but I just thought it would be a cool educational opportunity to walk people through and see like what people have done to the land, destroyed it. It's destroying it. It's literally destroy it. And then see how over time the restoration takes place because it's, I mean, it's current, right? We're building this thing. And so you're going to be able to see this just by getting all the trash out. Within a year's time, you're going to see Thor coming back. And it's, it's spectacular kind of what, the South thing that was and what has evolved over just the last five years. Once they got all the big trash out, just the restoration has been taking place. Tell me about the mounted horse patrols. Yeah. So it was a program initiated by the integrated resource program manager, Erin Eichenberg. And so she kind of, she's a big horse advocate. And so she kind of collaborated with a, a friend throughout the community who is on rides horses as well and so there was a big actually following there's a big horse community in north las vegas surprisingly so that kind of surprised me when i first moved here because i was driving to the monument and you see horses just walking down the road, driving down the road. <laughs> and so it was kind of a cool experience seeing that but yeah they're a group that's completely 100 percent on board of preserving and protecting the, the monument itself and then they're also allowing the building capacity for us because they're they're going into the monument along the pre-established road systems that were already there during BLM management. And they're also GPSing a lot of these sites or these road systems as they go because we're, we still don't have good GPS data along these roads. And so they're helping us with that. They help with getting out to the back country uh, to pull out some of the bigger legacy trash that we just can't get to because we don't have 
vehicles, one vehicles will just destroy the, the land more. But we just can't get to it either, right? It's, it's, it's too rough of a terrain that the horses can get to it. So there, uh, we're working with the cleanup crew to potentially get back in that back country to pull some of those bigger items out. And these horse patrols are volunteers? They are volunteers, yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell me about the Monuments Advisory Council. Uh, who's on that and what's it tasked with? So probably maybe legislation, when it was created, it was states in there that it will have an advisory council to focus on the general management plan, to plan and advise to that general management plan. And so currently there's 10 members and they're all made up of different stakeholders throughout the Las Vegas area. And so you got the county commissioner, the representative from Clark County, which is the county com- commissioner. We have representatives from both cities. We have paleontologists and and folks are Dallas Air Force Base is also representing on that, and the Las Vegas Paiute as well. So they're all, it's a member of 10, of 10 members, and we meet three to four times a year. And when we meet, we discuss one, the activities that have taken place up to the general management plan, kick off. And then now, since it's kicked off, um, what the milestones and what different expectations of that, that, of that advisory council are going to be during this management plan process. And so um, we're still learning those expectations because it's still in a dra- the, the project agreement, it's still in a draft statement. And so once that's kind of finalized, there's gonna be a lot clearer expectations of what they're gonna contribute. But I think the contribution has already been made because they're subject matter experts. They have connections within these different, with different areas throughout the Las, the Las Vegas area. area. And then they can bring a lot of support, um, experience, knowledge to the management plan itself. So it'll be great. I'm Lynn Riddick, and I'll be back with Park Superintendent Derek Carter after this short break. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experiences in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. That's P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Enjoy a reduced auto loan rate this holiday season with Interior FCU. With rates as low as 1.99% and a quick approval, you could finance a truck, car, or even snowmobile. Dash through the snow and over to Interior FCU for a great rate. For a limited time only, new and used car rates are the same at an all-time low. Interior Federal Credit Union, the official credit union for the Department of the Interior and your natural resource for financial services. Membership is required. I'm Lynn Riddick, and I'm back with Thule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument Park Superintendent, Derek Carter. Talk a little bit more about educational opportunities and collaborations with schools. 
so we just hired a uh, park guide. And so she just completed her, uh, Dr. Lauren Perry, she's actually just completed her UNLV doctorate program in paleontology. So an excellent hire, if you ask me. And so um, she also has educational background. So we've been working together with the resource program manager and also the park guide to kind of create that uh, classroom access, right? And so we we just hired a, or we just completed a teacher range of teacher program, which we hired a local teacher from the Clark County school system, which is, a, it's an ongoing national park program. And I'm a huge advocate of it. And um, the teacher came in and worked with the park guide to basically go through curriculum. This year's project was to, to go through virtual curriculum to update it to the school system standards and then post it so it's able to uh, virtually be seen throughout the, you know, or accessed for Las Vegas teachers or school systems, and then also accessed nationally. And so we're currently going through the process of uploading it, so it should be available on our website. Um, so it's curriculum K through 12 that basically speaks to, to the springs, but also speaks to the different science science of the monument itself, right? Erosion, geology, hydrology, paleontology. So it has all those different aspects in it. Um, so that's kind of where we're looking at educational programs currently, just because we're so small staff. But we also like to get, you know, we have some field trips planned within the coming months with the different schools, just because they're going back, they're finally going back to the classroom. So they reached out and we're, we're trying to coordinate some school field trips out to through the, the monument because there, there are actually schools that border the monument itself. And so what another great opportunity, one, to create future stewards of the, the monument itself, teach the, the, the younger generation about the monument, how to preserve and protect it, and then therefore they go home and then potentially uh, educate their family. And so... Um, why not access those schools? I think it's just a great opportunity. It just it goes hand in hand. It's a win-win to educate, to outreach, and then also hopefully protect and preserve um, in the future. Absolutely. So you mentioned Creech Air Force Base. Um, is the airspace above the monument still used for training by the base? And uh, if so, uh, what kind of military training operations might visitors see overhead? And is it very frequent? Yeah, so the naval legislation um, allows that air corridor to be used by Nellis Air Force Base, uh, in Creech Air Force Base, between Nellis and Creech. And so the avenue, I believe, is not within, it's slight, it looks like when you're standing in the monument, it's over the monument, but it's actually to the, just the north of it. So it, you're going to see aircraft fly through, um, but it seems to me uh, that they're just c connecting between Nellis and Creech Air Force Base. And so... There's not a lot of training that takes place within that corridor. It's just a lot of, it's a flight path per se. So they're just kind of flying in between the two bases. You'll see, I believe F-16s, uh, F-18s, um, and then also some helicopters that fly through there. But Nellis Air Force and Creech Air Force Base have been spectacular when it came to um, volunteering. So the Air Force, I think, uh, has a community outreach program and so they do a lot of volunteering and they've reached out on multiple occasions and gave us so much support and a lot of restoration activities, trash cleanups that we've had throughout the, the last year. And so they show up in, in hordes, um, all the airmen show up in hordes and it's a great time and they're always great to get along with. And um, they bring a lot to the table in helping us out. So it's great. It's a great uh, partnership. So I was in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted to go out and visit the monument. However, I didn't have a car. I didn't have a rental car. And I thought mm -hmm. if I Ubered there, I might not be able to get an Uber back. So what kind of visitation opportunities do you feel like you have being so close to Las Vegas? And what kind of uh, challenges do you have regarding transportation? I'm kind of curious to know whether most of your visitors are, are local, if you even know that much. So I, I think it's a mix. So there's a lot of local, but I get a, a tons of calls um, and our, you know, our, our admin assistant, she also gets tons of calls from people that are traveling, that will be traveling, asking where to park, where to go. And so 
And we always get tons of um, informational emails about where we get the passport stamp that I've been there recently and it's fantastic. Where can we get the passport stamp? And so I think there's a, a, a good balance between more probably local than people traveling. But you're right. And it's a great that you brought that up about the public transportation. How can we get public uh, access, more public access to some of these uh, kiosks, these interpretive kiosks and trailheads that we're potentially going to put in in the future. So that actually got brought up at a public meeting I was just recently attended as well. Um, it was an elderly, 55 plus community that I went and spoke to. And actually they said, well, I don't own a car. I use public transportation a lot. So how can I get to this kiosk? And so I was like, great question. We're going to take that. We're going to take them to the general management plan and work with hopefully the community leaders and see and understand where we could look at the transportation plan and where we can maybe extend those bus stops to where people can get on the bus and then be dropped off at the trailhead and actually have the scheduling get picked back up, right? So it's how can we plan it? Because currently, I know one for a fact, the but there's no bus stop. It's it's about a mile away. So if we can maybe extend that, it'd be great. The other one, I, I was up at the other interpretive kiosk the other day. And I, was, I had that in my mind. And I think there is a bus stop there. I just need to look at the city to understand if the buses actually still travel there. Because it looked like there is a bus stop. But I think that's just, you know, excess in the future is how can we get public access and, you know, more frequently by using public transportation, especially if folks come like yourself to the city and don't have a, a, a car or afraid to take an Uber, right? Because you might not get Uber back because it is tough, right? Once you get further outside the city from the strip, there's less pickup opportunity because there's no community. So yeah, it's a great question. I'm excited to kind of work with this general management plan to understand how we can, and the advisory council to understand how we can maybe look at that, that problem set and then that challenge and then and take it and evolve it. So I'm just curious, um, at night, how bright is the glow from Las Vegas? It's surprising it's not that bad. Uh, you know, I've been out there at night, and so, yeah, you're going to get the neighborhood, the light, um, light pollution from the neighborhoods that abut it, but currently the the developers we're working with, were, they're under more understanding now of how the lights affect fauna at night, and so they're going to be trying to institute the night-friendly light systems throughout their communities which is great it's a, it's a win for us and in, in trying to down that um, light pollution and we also kicked off or we're going to initiate our, our initial night sky program so we as you know we came together as a staff and yeah we're not a dark sky right we understand that but it gives visitors opportunities to come to these night sky programs that may have never looked at a telescope right we've never I may have never seen the moon close up or, or different star systems we got the you know in the sky. So we initiate this program and I think it kicks off November 20th for our first night sky program. And so the further you go up within the monument, the further away from the strip, it's darker. So that's where our first night sky program is going to be. But then we're going to have some other ones that are close to these communities that saying, hey, yeah, we know, understand there's light pollution coming from this urban you know development but hey you can still see things and it might you know it might stir some curiosity it might spark an interest in someone that never thought they would see the moon close up and so that's kind of where we're presenting these opportunities for future visitors that may have never had them before but from the strip itself you can see it from the, the monuments and the parking areas but it's it's not blinding right it's not, it's not like you're standing on the strip which is so blinding <laughs> Well, you've been at your position for about a year and a half now, and you came from Lassen Volcanic National Park. Uh, what's the biggest difference? Um, access to things. <laughs> I would say that from my personal perspective, uh, you know, just, you know, access to the community, right? And because Lassen's pretty isolated, even though I loved every minute that I've worked there, it was a completely different environment. You know, it's in, in mountainous, volcanic, and, it was an amazing opportunity, but it was a big contrast. And I never lived in the desert either. So, um, but to say that, that I, I'm falling in love with it. It's it's kind of a cool environment to live. 
and kind of work in it's it is stark contrast but kind of uh grown to like it a lot it must have been tough for you to hear about the wildfire going through lassen yeah so um i actually reached out um i i I wanted to present myself, or at least give myself um, the opportunity to give back to that department that was going through the Dixie Fire there. Um, it just didn't work out for my schedule, but I wanted to jump on to, as an agency administrator during the fire. Um, like I said, it just didn't work out for me. But yeah, I reached out to the superintendent and kind of had a discussion with him about it. And it was unfortunate, but because it, it just went through that park and destroyed a lot of the forest there but it's it was so beautiful but now i would actually like to go back just to kind of see the difference in what it what it did because you know, it's so devastating how far of a drive from your office in boulder city is it to the monument it's about 40 to 45 minutes you could it take a little longer depending on traffic uh there is some traffic issues once you get near kind of the 15 interchange but uh yeah it's about 40 to 45 minutes do you get to get out to the site every day? Not every day. Um, so I'll get up there about on a good week. I'll be up there two, three times. Uh, you know, typical week, it's uh, maybe once. Now you have a broad military background, having served as an officer in the U.S. Army. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that and whether any of your military skills have been useful in managing a national monument. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. So, yeah, sort of active military for 10 years and is a Green Beret. So, got, you know, as a Green Beret, your, your skill sets are very broad uh, and a lot of planning, a lot of operational planning, strategic planning. So, coming into this position, and also you're doing a lot of different things. There's something new every day. Uh, and so, you're, you're understanding how you can build strong partnerships about these you know different areas around the world and so bringing that into this position a brand new national monument had you know it's building from the ground up it's partnership heavy very partnership heavy and so how do you build and collaborate those relationships throughout the community how do you build capacity and so capacity is a huge issue um, and trying to progress this forward and so with our limited staff how can we build that capacity and so we've partnered with great partners throughout the Las Vegas area and helping us move and progress the monument forward. And so the operational and strategic planning as well has helped out kind of having that background going into this general management plan and understanding how to envision something for, and what's going to happen in the next you know, 5, 10, 20 years and, and looking at the secondary and tertiary effects of what that decision now is going to be when you make it in long term. And so you know, a lot, you know, at least for me, a lot of folks who plan something, make a decision on one item, but not think of long term effects or how that's going to be in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And so that experience and having that understanding background has helped a lot. Did you have an interest in fossils prior to your appointment there at Tule Springs? Who doesn't? <laughs> it's just so fast, right? I uh, when I I remember interviewing that uh, my interview actually asked that, and I said, you know, as a kid, you know, I loved dinosaurs, right? And even though these are different fossils, I always think there's a, a a spark of curiosity there when it comes to like connecting with the past, and you know, finding something in the ground and and understanding like where did this come from, what is it, and so um, I. <laughs> I always had an interest in kind of the past and history. So, you know, of course, there was the dinosaurs, which, you know, I think all, most kids have that interest. But now it's coming to, you know, what's, at least I'm learning. And I I love the continuation of education for myself and the understanding of it coming into this, working with paleontologists. I think it's just so cool. Archaeologists, I think, you know, I, I was an Indiana Jones fan growing up, but, you know, learning what archaeologists do, I think they, it's a cool field to kind of understand and to kind of work with them every day. It's just unlearning. And so, yeah, to kind of answer the question, I had an interest in fossils and, and continuing to grow. Derek, I'd like to thank you for your time today. Um, we'll be curious to see how the site evolves under your leadership, and we wish you the best. 
Thanks, Len. I appreciate it. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Before closing, I'd like to take a moment to thank all the listeners who have supported The Traveler in recent weeks with a donation. We're halfway through our biggest fundraiser ever and about halfway to our goal of raising $100,000 to ensure you have an editorially independent media outlet dedicated to covering national parks and protected areas for years to come. If you haven't yet donated, please consider putting your support behind a media outlet that keeps you informed on what goes on within the national park system throughout the year. Next week, we'll be discussing Yosemite National Park as a hiker's paradise. For those who only know of the Yosemite Valley, this will be an eye-opening discussion. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Rappenjack. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Split Beard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.